1979's Alien burst out of the studio's chest and fled into theaters to critical and commercial success. To say even that is an understatement. It won the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects. It's preserved in the Library of Congress as culturally significant and launched a media franchise that exists to this very day, scaring multiple generations of people. Due to Alien's success, Brandywine Productions wanted to follow Alien up with a sequel. How would you follow that up? Would you do a similar story where a ship gets redirected by an evil corporation to the alien planetoid? Or perhaps another planet that houses this alien threat? Perhaps a prequel about the space jockey and how he ended up on the planet? Maybe a rehash but with slightly different scenarios and characters? Or would you follow up on that original film and continue the story of alien survivor Ellen Ripley, played by Sigourney Weaver, and explore what it means to survive something so horrific and so challenging to one's mental state that most people can't even fathom? Why did it take Brandywine Productions seven years to release a follow-up to one of the most unsettling films of all time? Why don't we take a step back and see why this was the case? As I said earlier, Brandywine Productions, led by Walter Hill and David Geiler, were eager to work on a follow-up to Alien, but due to 20th Century Fox constantly shifting upper management and shifting attitudes towards Alien, with the studio considering it a financial loss, they were not able to get a deal set in stone. Also, Geiler and Hill sued 20th Century Fox over unpaid profits and that halted production for a few years as well. When the lawsuits were settled, Geiler came across a script for a movie called The Terminator, written by a fresh screenwriter and director named James Cameron. They asked him to write a treatment for a sequel to Alien, but with a story like the films Southern Comfort and The Magnificent Seven, featuring Ripley and Soldiers. With initial studio rejection of his treatment and delay of filming The Terminator, Cameron developed his treatment further, adding more detail, drawing from a story he had written called Mother, about a female character fighting a large alien with a power loader or mechanized exoskeleton that includes the idea of terraforming worlds and the term xenomorph. Cameron also wanted to be director, but the producers felt he was too inexperienced. They did like his extended treatment enough that if the Terminator was successful, they would allow him to direct and his wife, Gail Ann Hurd, could produce. The Terminator was not only a success, but a cultural staple quoted to this very day. Therefore, Cameron was given the go-ahead to create a terrifying, explosive, high-stakes sequel, ultimately titled Aliens. There will be spoilers if you have not seen it, so tune out and watch the film. You're in for a hell of a treat. Aliens begins with the shuttle from Alien, the Narcissus, being spotted and tractored in by a salvage ship, hence rescuing Ripley, the last survivor of the U.S. CSS Nostromo, a towing vessel hauling a massive mineral refinery. Ripley wakes up in a hospital on Gateway Station, a space station orbiting Earth, only to find out that she has been adrift in space for 57 years. She also has recurring nightmares about the alien and the possibility of her having a chest-bursting situation like Kane in Alien. She meets Burke, played by Paul Reiser, a lower executive at the company Wayland yutani who breaks the news to her about the time past and that her only daughter had recently passed away of natural causes. So not only does Ripley have the horrific experience of the previous film to deal with, but now she is displaced in time. Everyone she ever knew is gone, including her own daughter, whom she promised to come back in time for her 11th birthday. To add to that, during an inquest with company and government agencies, Ripley testifies what happens to the Nostromo and the rest of the crew revealing the existence of the alien and the LV-426 distress call. Her words fall on skeptical ears and her license to operate and fly a commercial space vehicle is revoked indefinitely and is ordered to undergo mandatory monthly psychiatric evaluations. Ripley asks the chairman, Van Leeuwen, to at least check out LV-426, and he says they don't have to. The planet has been terraformed and colonized for decades. Meanwhile, on LV-426, a settlement called Hadley's Hope is revealed where 100 to 150 colonists live. The foreman of the project reveals that the Jordans, a scavenger family, 
went to coordinates ordered by a Weyland yutani executive. And in this particular work culture, the less questions asked, the better off you'll be. The Jordans are a family, a mom, dad, Newt, and Timmy. Mr. Jordan is excited that whatever he is able to salvage will be his, only for the audience to find out that what he finds is the derelict alien craft that caused the events of the first film. He goes in the ship with his wife for a long time, only for us to see Mrs. Jordan dragging Mr. Jordan out with a face hugger on his face and calling, Mayday! Mayday! A month goes by. Ripley is staying in a tiny apartment on Earth, working a low-end job, and is forced to undergo perpetual psychiatric evaluations. She is still having profound nightmares and gets a visit from Burke and Lieutenant Gorman of the Colonial Marines. They tell her that they lost contact with the colony on LV-426, and they are going to send the Marines in to investigate. They want Ripley there as a consultant when it comes to dealing with the aliens. Ripley refuses, saying she will not go through the horror again, and asks them to leave. After another recurring nightmare, Ripley calls Burke and accepts on the condition that they wipe out the aliens and not bring them back for study. Enter the USS Sulaco, approaching alien planet LV-426 in a sequence that is reminiscent of the beginning of Alien, on the Nostromo showing the interior of the ship with everyone asleep. The Sulaco is the ship that is transporting Ripley, Burke, and the Colonial Marines. They all awaken from hypersleep and we meet the Colonial Marines under Lieutenant Gorman, starting with Sergeant Apone, a cigar-chewing hard-ass Marine, Corporal Hicks, the stoic second-in-command, Private Hudson, the company clown, Vasquez, the badass female, her friend Drake, and the rest. Tensions brew as Ripley finds out at breakfast that Bishop, the executive officer of the Sulaco, under Gorman, is an android and tells him to stay the hell away from her. If you remember, Ash tried to silence her, an alien. Before they begin mission preparations, Ripley briefs the Marines on what they're going to be dealing with, but it kind of flies past most of the troops, except for Hicks. We see power loader exoskeletons prepping the dropship called the Bug Stomper and find out Ripley knows how to use these. As a side note, if this scene was in a movie made today, this would be forgotten and not be used at all later in the film. All personnel occupy the Armored Personal Carrier, or APC, which is itself inside the Bug Stomper and they descend to LV-426 while the Sulaco is on autopilot. The dropship drops off the APC and drives to Hadley's Hope to find it deserted on the outside. The Marines go in and secure the facility, only to find it abandoned as well, with signs of a struggle between the aliens and the people, with several massively corroded holes in the floors and ceilings, further corroborating Ripley's testimony. The Marines find a lab with two containers containing two living facehuggers, apparently yanked off their hosts, killing them in the process. The only surviving colonist is a traumatized young girl named Newt, who doesn't think she's safe even with the Marines. Private Hudson is able to get a fix on the trackers of the colonists and determines they are all gathered in the atmospheric processing plant, likely forced against their will and abducted. The Marines go into the sublevel of the plant at where they find the alien nest with colonists cocooned to the walls. Ripley points out, and this is very important, is that the nest is right next to the primary heat exchangers of the plant. If the heat exchangers are ruptured in any way, you can say goodbye to the cooling system and that will cause greater problems down the line. So, Lieutenant Gorman orders a pwn to confiscate all magazines and smart gun batteries, but Vasquez has two secret spare batteries and gives one to Drake. They find a colonist cocooned to a wall. She wakes up and begs the Marines to kill her but a chestburster begins to emerge. The Marines waste no time and incinerate it and the cocoon colonist. The aliens, thanks to their ability to camouflage themselves to the walls, are able to ambush and attack the Marines right away, killing 75% of them, including Sergeant Apone. Vasquez and Drake open fire on the aliens with their smart guns. Gorman loses control of the situation and is indecisive, hence Ripley takes charge and drives the APC to the Marines allowing them to escape the alien nest. They get in, but with the CQC, the acid for blood acts as a defense mechanism and kills Drake and wounds Hudson's arm. Gorman is incapacitated, hence Corporal Hicks is now in command and agrees with Ripley's suggestion that they should nuke the entire site from orbit. Hicks calls a dropship to pick them up and the APC 
but an alien drone sneaks on board the dropship, killing the pilots while it's flying and crashes into the APC, destroying the majority of their weapons and supplies. This realization leads to Hudson's famous line. Game over, man. It's game over. What the fuck are we gonna do now? What are we gonna do? Ripley and the survivors hole up in the main facility, barricading themselves in after learning that the aliens like to come out at night and abduct people. They set up two turret guns for each of the corridors that guard the area the survivors are in. During all this excitement, Ripley finds out that Burke wants the two alien facehuggers preserved for transport back to the Whalen yutani Company's Weapons Research Division. Ripley also finds out that it was Burke that ordered someone to go investigate the coordinates where the derelict ship was, hence causing the destruction of the colony and the deaths of the colonists. Ripley confronts Burke and promises to expose him for this, but the group has bigger problems. Apparently, shooting the aliens in the nest has ruptured the primary heat exchangers, causing the atmospheric processing plant to destabilize, causing a thermal nuclear explosion to occur within a few hours. To escape, Bishop needs to go to the colony's transmitter and manually bring the spare dropship from the Sulaco down to the surface for evacuation. Ripley finds Newt under the bed and goes to sleep right next to her. She wakes up shortly later to find the containers with the facehuggers are on the floor and opened. Holy shit, two of those fucking things are lurking around the room with them. One facehugger tries to attack them and retreats. Ripley and Newt try to scream, but the room is soundproof. They try to break the glass, but the transparency is shatterproof. Luckily, there is a sprinkler system in the room, and Ripley uses her lighter to set the sprinklers off. Thank God for smoking, because apparently it saved her a newt. Being a non-smoker, I would have been screwed in that situation since I'd never carry a lighter or anything in general that would light a cigarette. The Marines are alerted to the situation, but the two facehuggers go on the attack. One attacking Ripley, trying to get to her face, and one creeping up on Newt, but Newt manages to keep it at bay. Hicks jumps through the glass, like the badass he is, and the Marines, including Gorman, dispatch the two facehuggers. The reason this happened was because Burke wanted to silence Ripley and at the same time smuggle alien chestbursters, using them as hosts, going through Earth customs, and kill the rest of the Marines in their sleep who know this while making up any story Burke saw fit. Hicks and the Marines decide to execute Burke for his treachery, but the group have bigger problems. Despite going at great lengths with the building plants to seal every possible means of the aliens reaching them, the aliens simply advance on them through the ceiling and attack the survivors. Burke, being the great symbol of virtue, locks the rest in with the aliens, leaving them to die. Hudson has his moment to shine, holding off the alien attack while the rest are trying to cut through the locked door. Hudson, however, gets attacked from below and is taken away, never to be seen again. Burke tries to escape further into the facility, only to be killed or abducted by an alien drone. The survivors are now in the vents, with the aliens in close pursuit. One alien attacks Vasquez and she manages to kill it with her handgun, but the acid for blood gets her in the leg, rendering her disabled. Gorman, whom she has a massive chip on her shoulder for, goes after her and tries to help her but they are both surrounded by approaching aliens, therefore they use the grenade, sacrificing themselves and the encroaching aliens. The blast knocks Newt down a chute and she ends up under the graded floor. The aliens, still pursuing, manage to abduct Newt right before Rickley and Hicks can cut through the floor. They try to flee to the roof by elevator, but a drone comes and attacks them there. Once again, shooting an alien at close range will activate the alien's defense mechanism and acid blood will spurt. This time, it hits Hicks in the face, incapacitating him. Ripley helps Hicks to the dropship and tells Bishop that they are not leaving and that they need to go back to the nest to rescue Newt. Earlier in the movie, Hicks teaches Ripley how to use the M41A pulse rifle. Therefore, she saddles up and assembles a new weapon duct taping the pulse rifle with an incinerator unit and the motion tracker. They enter the atmospheric processing plant and Ripley goes down the elevator into the alien nest alone. She finds Newt's tracker, but hears Newt's screams as a facehugger is emerging from an egg right near Newt's cocoon. 
Ripley dispatches it and the nearby drones and rescues Newt. Attempting to flee the destabilizing plant, Ripley stumbles into a lair surrounded by several eggs being laid by a gigantic alien queen. Ripley incinerates the nest and destroys the queen's ovipositor with pulse grenades and manages to dispatch the defending drones. Ripley and Newt flee and get to the elevator with the alien queen now detached from her ovipositor in pursuit. They return to the landing pad, but Bishop is gone. The place is destroying itself and the alien queen is coming up the elevator. Ripley, accepting her fate, throws away her weapon, but at the last minute, Bishop comes back and they board, fleeing the plant and the planet with an epic thermonuclear blast going off, destroying the colony and the surrounding area. Back on the Sulaco, with Hicks still incapacitated on the dropship, Ripley and Bishop leave the ship only for Bishop to be impaled by the Alien Queen's tail. The Alien Queen survived the blast and is hiding in the landing struts. Bishop gets ripped in half and Newt hides in the floor, with Ripley fleeing into the power loader closet. The Queen goes after Newt and manages to pull the grates and corner her. Ripley resurfaces, now controlling a power loader, saying this iconic line, Ripley and the Queen battle with Ripley avoiding head bites and tail attacks until she finally grapples the Queen in the neck and opens the vertical airlock to flush the Queen out into space. The Queen manages to pull Ripley in the loader down the airlock with her, but Ripley manages to get out of the loader and start climbing, pulls the lever that bypasses safety by opening the airlock doors and expels the Queen into space. Ripley barely clambers to the ladder, climbs back up, and shuts the airlock doors. The mission finally over. Ripley then helps Hicks and Bishop to hypersleep, and then she and Newt go to hypersleep themselves for their return journey to Earth. For this film being James Cameron's second major science fiction project, it is pretty fucking impressive at how not only this film faithfully followed the first film up, but how it managed to reinvent itself with new ideas. This film, despite being an action film, also retains the suspense, intention, and some of the horror from the first film. It also faithfully and believably followed Ripley's story, giving her a very good character arc in this film, not only allowing her to come to terms with the horrific events of the first film, but also coming to terms with the fact that she is displaced in time, with her only daughter dying of old age, and everyone she ever knew is either really old or deceased. The payoff for her character comes at the end where she gets the courage to not only face the aliens alone, but also to rescue Newt, who she develops a maternal relationship with over the course of the film. And it is a second chance for her when she couldn't be there for her real daughter. This is perfectly set up earlier in the film in the deleted scene of Burke revealing her daughter's fate, and of course having continual nightmares of the alien. She steps up, saves the lives of the Marines during the initial visit to the nest after Gorman's inexperience leads to his failure to lead and makes plans on how to survive the aliens onslaught and the impending colony destruction. The mission would have failed if Burke didn't bring her along and Cameron, like with Sarah Connor, did a good job of creating a strong female character that is believable, relatable, and likable. This film is practically a perfect sequel in my mind to the first Alien and is up there with the greatest sequels of all time including The Empire Strikes Back, The Wrath of Khan, Terminator 2, and many many others. The only gripe I have is that I don't like the way the Alien drones look in this movie compared to the original Alien. The original Alien was more humanoid, less bug-like, and had that really elongated shiny chrome head that made it an ingredient for nightmares. I can't think of anything else to gripe about though. This movie was just that damn good. I want to give a special shout out to the designers of the first two films. H.R. Giger was the one who designed the alien and the interiors of the derelict ship making it the stuff of nightmares and he himself was disturbed at having these images in his head. Ron Cobb designed the Nostromo and the interior of the Nostromo in Alien and returned in Aliens to design the colony and the interiors of the colony and the Sulaco. 
Sid Mead designed the exterior of the Sulaco, the dropships, and the power loader. He also did designs on Blade Runner, Tron, and the mecha designs for Turn A Gundam for all you Gundam fans listening. Going forward, I might cover the later films, but I'm not a fan of Alien 3. In isolation, Alien 3 is not a bad film, but I disagree with the story direction because I feel it does a major disservice to aliens. Killing Newt and Hicks off right away and having a facehugger on board with nobody knowing just feels contrived just to get Ripley to a prison planet and trying to be the first alien again with a single alien in horror. Also, the fate of Ripley in this film was relatively dark for what she went through. I wanted her to have a happy ending ultimately. They bring her back as a clone in the cash grab known as Alien Resurrection, but that went nowhere and is largely forgotten. A great project that deserves a shout out is Alien Xeno by Neil Blomkamp who directed District 9 and Chappie, acting as a true sequel to Aliens, where Alien 3 and Resurrection are retconned in favor of this film. It would not only have uh, Sigourney Weaver return to play an older Ripley, but Michael Bean would come back and play an older Hicks, and even Newt would return as an adult. Just the use of those characters already makes it a better film than Alien 3, in my opinion, and furthers the story arc of Aliens. Unfortunately, the project got shelved in favor of Alien Covenant, but hey, Blomkamp announced that the screenplay for District 10 is underway, so who knows at this point? Alien and Aliens are two of the greatest science fiction films of all time that manage to complement each other immensely and create another science fiction franchise in the process that is still around to this very day. The first film being a sci-fi horror disaster film and Aliens being an action thriller film with horror elements managed to entertain audiences to this very day and the iconic Alien or Xenomorph still terrifies people to this very day with Alien Isolation playthroughs alone being all the proof I need. Aliens has shown that women can be believably strong characters and that despite a past trauma, you can confront that and grow in the process and step up to help others who are in similar situations. Ripley's character arc vastly improves in this film and I can understand why people say this film is the best in the series, surpassing even the original. I, however, prefer the original for the atmosphere and the horror, but Aliens retains the disaster thriller aspect. Remember how I said we will be fucking ready for what's out there in my Alien video? Well, in Aliens, humanity did fight back with heavy costs, but ultimately won in the end. No matter where we are, humanity will continue to struggle and fight for our place in the universe, and no matter what happens, we will never go quietly into the night. On the next episode, let's take a break from outer space and science fiction and go back to Earth in 1936. Can a man be a college professor and an adventurer at the same time? Is there any payoff for braving ancient booby traps and securing artifacts? Why is the Third Reich interested in this man? Do these artifacts confirm the existence of a higher power? Should you bring a gun to a sword fight? All these questions and more on the next episode of Nerdporeal Reviews, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Make sure you're still subbed. Is man ready to learn the ancient secrets and harness its power? Let's make the discovery together. Take care.